Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here at the Heritage Foundation. As Director of Lectures and Seminars, it's my privilege to welcome everyone to our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium and, of course, to wa welcome those who join us on our Heritage.org website. Uh, we would ask everyone in-house if you'll make that courtesy check that cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin. It will be appreciated. We will, of course, post the program within 24 hours on our website for everyone's future reference. And, of course, our Internet viewers are welcome at any time to send questions or comments simply addressing those emails to speaker at heritage.org. Our guest today is proof that one person can indeed make a difference. After 9-11, as the mother of three in rural Montana, who was also serving as a municipal judge, she immediately began formulating a plan to respond to this unprecedented attack on the United States. Her efforts succeeded even as she will admit, beyond imagination. Ultimately joining forces with the FBI, she participated in sting operations and, pion and pioneered digital entrapment tactics at the forefront of today's war on terror. Through her work, a new field of espionage, cyber counterintelligence, has been founded. We are pleased to welcome Shannon Ross Miller to the Heritage Foundation today. Each of us owes her a special debt of gratitude for her courage. We look forward to hearing in greater detail from her about her saga as an unexpected patriot. Shannon, welcome to Heritage. Thank you. Well, first, I just want to thank the Heritage Foundation for having me here today. It's quite an honor and a little intimidating, so I'm just going to try and get through this the best I can. But um, I'm just going to make a few quick remarks about my book, just a little bit about my story, and then as I understand it, we're going to do some question and answer. So um, on 9-11, I didn't know much about terrorist groups or their ideologies. I knew even less about the Arab world and its culture. However, the events of 9-11 deeply affected me to my core and eventually caused me to look within myself to find the courage and determination to fight terrorism on a level that hadn't been seen before. As I, at the time I started my, my quest in fighting terrorism, I had no idea or could imagine that the work I undertook in pioneering counterintelligence on the internet would become known as cyber counterintelligence and come to hold one of the keys to fighting terrorism in the war on terror. Through my efforts, the U.S. government would come to prosecute two of the largest cases of domestic terrorism and espionage in U.S. history since 9-11. In the case of Army Specialist Ryan Anderson, who received the largest conviction to date in the war on terror, having been sentenced to five life terms for his crimes against our country. And the second one was um, State of Pennsylvania, or <laughs> Michael Colonel Rennes, um, who plotted to blow up the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, as well as four other energy infrastructure locations here in the United States, in what he envisioned, envisioned as the 9-11 plot of energy. Over the past 10 years, I worked over 200 cases of threat of terrorism against the United States and its interest abroad. With the 10-year anniversary of the tragic events of 9-11 fast approaching, it is important that we not forget the day that changed the country and the world forever and caused the course of history and mankind to forever be altered. Though Americans suffered immeasurable personal loss of nearly 3,000 souls that day and thousands of our horrible soldiers, I'm sorry, honorable soldiers have given their lives in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the Al-Qaeda terrorists who sought to defeat America have failed to <laughs> impale the American spirit of perseverance. As a proud American, I believe that if our strength and perseverance as a country is to grow and continue, we need to identify what it means to be an American today in a post-9-11 world and explore what we can do collectively and individually to pay it forward by selfless and good deeds made to our community and to our country to continue to make America the greatest country in the world. There are stories throughout history of individuals who stepped up and gave, gave of themselves to become pioneers for betterment of mankind. Too often we believe that our inabilities, shortcomings, fears, and weaknesses prevent, prevent us from doing the unthinkable to affect change. However, if each and every one of us looks within ourselves, there is something we can have to offer that can ultimately make a difference. It is my hope that in sharing my personal story and experience in fighting terrorism, that people will identify within themselves what it is they can offer, not only to our country, but to our communities to affect change for the betterment of all. So my question, that I would pose to each one of you is, can one person make a difference against the, in the face of odds? And the answer is yes, with a caveat that the key to positively and productively being an architect of change requires each and every one of us to identify where and how we can give of ourselves to make a difference. And finally, I will leave you with one final thought, and that is, 
please ask yourself, what can you do to make your community and our world a better place for mankind? So. I'll help you start off the story. <laughs> a little nervous. Did I understand in the audience and the uh, outside that you were essentially recovering from surgery? Where were you at 9-11, and why would you start this? Oh, yeah. Um, no, well, it wasn't surgery, but on the evening of 9-11, um, I, had, I had fallen, and I suffered a hairline fracture to my pelvis. So that left me kind of laid up for about five weeks. And so I just kept, you know, it, it was very emotional and dramatic, and as the events kept, continued to unfold on television, it was, um, it just impacted me to the point where I wanted to try and understand these people, what they, how they could do what they did, and then, you know, I, eventually then I took it a step further and decided to start communicating and interacting with them. And how would, where did you find the network? Oh, the first, I mean the first four. Yeah. Well, I was watching um, a news broadcast on CNN, I think it was in November of 2001, and it talked about a website or an internet forum where there was terrorist chatter and communications, and I wrote down the website, and I, I, I went there and viewed it, and that's kind of where it all started. Oh, please don't give, <laughs> please don't give CNN credit for starting uh, this whole news thing. <laughs> okay. If there are any comments from the audience, we'll be glad to have them yeah. or questions, too. Uh, but it is interesting, as, as we noted in the uh, text of your book also, I believe no one in the family knew you were doing this. Well, they had a, you know, obviously they'd seen me, you know, viewing things and learning and reading about, you know, the terrorist groups and what was going on in the war on terror. But um, I hadn't, I didn't make it a point to inform anybody in my family that I'd... And they learned it, how? Well, how, how it happened was um, I received um, an encrypted file that I opened one morning, early in the morning, and it crashed the computer. And so as my, my, my husband was trying to recover everything, there was a large amount of Arabic files that I eventually had to come and explain. So that's how he, <laughs> that's how he came to understand what I was doing. Any comments, questions on stories from the audience? Yeah, Cully. Judge, thanks so much uh, for your... See, I told you we were formal. We that's your, okay. your book and your... your um, undying loyalty to our country. Um, I'm Cully Stimson from the Heritage Foundation. You obviously had to mentally pass a bunch of hurdles before you could give yourself the green light to do this. Um, some were practical ones, like, I don't know Arabic. I assume you didn't know any no. Arabic. Uh, others were, I'm a judge. I know that there's the law out there. There's a law of entrapment. Could you walk us through any aspect of either the sort of logistical hurdles that were there, like learning Arabic, uh, the law of entrapment, mm -hmm. which is clear, but there's international implications. Sure. And then I, I was struck by your, your excellent interview yesterday on the Diane Reem show where you were asked at the end about personal security and whether mm -hmm. you were uh, ever concerned for yourself or your family. So if you could touch on any of those, uh, we'd be most grateful. Okay, sure. Um, <clears throat> Well, first of all, just to I'll address the last one first. As far as the security goes, um, I, I won't. I don't talk in detail about what that is, other than to say that I do have it. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, over the last two years, it, I've. The question is asked. You know, um, are you ever going to feel like you can, you know, not have to look over your shoulders, and um, and be in fear? And there was a time, in um, like 2006 and 2007, where that was really paramount and uh, you know on the front burner and. Um, but with the FBI's help and everything, um, I, I do have security, and I'm at a point where I feel safe and comfortable. So as far as um, your other question, when I, um, I didn't know Arabic. I, I mean, uh, when I first stumbled into that first website, it was all in Arabic. The only thing I could do was look at the pictures. And so, and they were, you know, they were disturbing, gory. But, you know, it, it said a lot, and I wanted to know what this chatter was and what they were talking about. So I purchased translation software. But if anybody knows anything about translation software, it's <laughs> you don't get the context of what's being stated. So um, I eventually wanted to, because I was becoming more involved in it, I wanted to under see if I could learn the language. And I don't, I would not say I know Arabic. It's a process, an ongoing process for me that uh, that I've been doing over the years. I'm far more fluent in jihadi talk than I am in formal Arabic talk. But that's what I need to, that's what I need to just how I need to talk when I do it. Um, and as far as uh, the law and everything, in doing this, you know, it's not something that I think that if I had not had the background in the law 
and, and know what it takes to make a case, and then as a judge, you know, knowing how to make decisions on rules of evidence and things like that.